Well, good morning. Um, brief pause while we sort out the chairs. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for coming, uh, for being here instead of um, outdoors on this the first nice day we've had in about eight months. Um, it's great to see you all here. My name's Stephanie Merritt, um, or SJ Paris, depending on which genre we're in. Um, and it's my very great pleasure to be talking this morning to two authors whose work I've admired for a long time, and one author who've, whose work I've come to admire only recently, but who I hope to be reading for many years to come. Um, to begin at the far end, Michael Chabon is the multi-award winning author of uh, many, many books, including eight novels, among them The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2001, and The Yiddish Policeman's Union, which won the Hugo Award in 2008, making him, I think, the only writer to have won both prizes. Uh, he's also uh, an author of non-fiction, short stories, horror, comic books, screenplays, and young adult fiction. And as Andrew said, he's been one of our judges for the Folio Prize this year. Mark Haddon is also a multi-award winning author, most famously of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, which was his first novel for adults, stroke young adults, um, which won the Whitbread Book of the Year in 2003, as well as the Commonwealth Writers Prize and the Guardian's Children's Book Award. He's published two more adult novels. He's written a play. He's also the author of many books for children, uh, many of which he illustrates himself, a collection of poetry and various other essays, reviews, pieces of nonfiction. Uh, Mark is a member of the Folio Academy. Emma McBride is one of the shortlisted authors, as you will know. Her debut novel uh, last year won the inaugural Goldsmiths Prize, A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing, and it's just been longlisted for the Bailey's Prize, which is a fantastic achievement. Um, so, <laughs> congratulations for that. I guess we should kick off, really, by clarifying what we mean by genre, because it's, a, I, I suppose, a relatively recent concept that at best should be simply descriptive, but it has acquired a de derogatory connotation over recent years. Now, Michael, I know you've written a great deal about this subject, including a fantastic essay which I would urge you all to read called Trickster in a Suit of Light, mm -hmm. which is uh, a great exploration of entertainment, genre, popular fiction. Um, well, I mean, the first problem I always think is in this discussion is how to pronounce the word, because <laughs> when you say, you know, genre, <laughs> you want to give it that sort of, it's like croissant, you know, or do you just say genre or, you know, genre? Um, it's just one of those, as soon as you start trying to pronounce the word, you either sound pretentious or stupid, depending on, <laughs> you know, which choice you make. Um, I mean, to me, it, it's a, it is a complicated discussion, partly because it, it's probably the wrong word for what we mean when we're talking about, what we tend to be talking about when we're talking about genres, science fiction, crime fiction, romance, those sort of, um, cat, they're categories in a way more than genres, and because I think traditionally uh, the genres are really poetry, epic poetry, lyric poetry, tragedy, comedy, um, but who cares? Um, <laughs> that's what we're calling it. Uh, you know, they're, um, to me, they're, what we're, we're talking about is a set of conventions, um, traditions, if you will, customs, um, uh, a set of tropes and um, formulas, types of story, types of subject matter that tend to be clumped together and tend to be associated with under the name, you know, crime fiction or science fiction or whatever it might be. And those have tended to accumulate and accrue um, over the years. And when you're talking about the kind of fiction that tends to be labeled genre fiction, you're talking about that, that, that accruing got done, you know, in cheap magazines and pulp magazines and and then in, um, <clears throat> uh, with the help of movies and other forms, other media over the years have become kind of crystallized into these categories that you, you, you think you know what they are when you hear the name. You get this sort of raft of associations with them. Um, but they're not, I, to me that's really all they are. Is these set, and, and all writing that takes place within a particular genre is usually written either just by completely following those conventions or 
uh, especially later in the history of a genre by attempting to break or circumvent or in some way or another um, turn upside, turn those conventions upside down. So you tend to see, you know, like science fiction that's written since the 1960s um, has tended to try to play with the conventions and play mm -hmm. with the familiar tropes. Look at like a writer like Terry Pratchett, for example. Um, but so to me, th I think if you look at something as a set of conventions, then all f any book you happen to pick up is going to belong to a genre in that sense, even if it's a John Updike novel about couples getting divorced in suburban Connecticut in 1968, that in itself to me is a genre. It's their naturalistic um, fiction and you tend to find things like divorce and uh, the death of a child or, um, you know, mm -hmm. divorce or, um, <laughs> you know, adultery. I mean, there are certain conventions and, and just, and writers who are working within that genre are just as um, free generally speaking, in their play with those expectations and in their play with those conventions and working against them or, or by following them. At, um, I, th I think it's a, it's a term that if it's used disapprovingly, it's being misused because I think it's a pretty neutral designation. Mm -hmm. And you've talked again in, in, uh, in that same essay about the idea of borderlands and the sort of cross crossover between these different right. forms um, and I'd like to to bring Mark in here because one of these borderlands that you talk about is the crossover between children's and adults literature and actually that that is very often a false distinction um, and there are some wonderful writers Mark and again uh, people like Philip Pullman or Marcus Zusak who are writing books that are neither you know and are not easily classified as children's or adults um, Mark, you've, you've written books that, that cross those kind of boundaries. Do, do you, when you set out to write a novel, are you very clear in your head, I'm writing for adults, I'm writing for children, I'm writing in this particular form, or is I it I was totally clear, everyone just decided to disagree with me after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to go back to what you're saying, I think genre is in fact three unrelated things which get really confused with each other. One, there's how you, how you arrange a bookshop and how people choose the books right. they're going to buy. Because you, you want to know, you want a book like that, I want, you want to go in and say, I want another book like that, so you look in the same mm -hmm. section. That's really sensible, and that's what readers want. And then there's a set of expectations you have as a reader of a writer, and you come to a book and it colours the way you, you read it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that certainly affected the way that I get read, for example. Mm. There was a really nice review of The Red House, my latest novel in the Irish Times, which said, he writes equally well for children and for grown-ups. And I thought... No one says of Ian McEwan, he writes really well for grown-ups, do they? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I always get seen through that, through that lens. <laughs> and there's a third, on, layered on top of that, there's this um, terrible handbag-slapping fight between literary people amongst themselves over who's allowed to stray across which borders. Mm -hmm. Is Margaret Atwood allowed to write science fiction? <laughs> and which, and which if she does, will she call it that? Well, exactly. yeah. Yeah, Is she so comfortable having it called science fiction? Too? But only, only in the book pages are people interested in that. I mean, if you're a reader, you're only interested in whether a book works mm -hmm. in and of itself. And I think that's a, quite an uninteresting debate outside the book world. Do you find that that is... Uh, but those, again, those particular um, categories between children's and, and adults is very restrictive because there are people being told, well, this isn't for you or this isn't, uh, you know, something that you ought to look at and therefore books are perhaps not reaching uh, the, the readership that they should have because they're being marketed as a with a particular label. Is this where I tell my boring ISBN story now? Please, please tell okay. your ISBN for, story. I for, for anyone who's heard this, I, I do forgive me. I've told it many, many times, but I think it's quite interesting. When um, Curious Incident was uh, published by Random House, they decided to publish it as in both a... Uh, Claire, my agent, who's sitting over there, which, when she read it, she said, I think we can, we can also sell this as a children's book. And when my heart sank, because <laughs> I've been trying not to write children's books for many, many years. It felt like I've been tunnelling for ten years and I come up in the commandant's office. <laughs> 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 but so she went, to, um, she went to Random House and rather amazingly, they, they arranged it so that they would buy it on behalf of two of their imprints, Jonathan Cape and David Fickling. And what they did, which was a stroke of genius, was that other publishers, like Bloomsbury, had tried to do crossover novels. They'd given these sort of teen novels a rather sort of sexy covers, and they thought adults would buy them as well. But unfortunately, in, in the bar, on the barcode at the back, it has your ISBN number, and buried within that is a code for children or adults. So it comes into the shop. Whatever it is on the cover, they, they just sort of scan it, and it says, mm. oh, kids section or not. So they produced right. the book um, with two barcodes, two ISBN numbers, and two covers. So the same book, and they put it in two parts of the bookshop. 
it worked incredibly well. It was a, it was a boring accountancy kind of thing, but was also a stroke of genius. But did one sort of uh, massively outsell the other, or were they quite equally balanced in, in terms of sales? Where people every time someone says this, I do have to point out they're more adults in the world than children. <laughs> 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 so yeah, the adult one outsold. Is that true? Trying to work out the math. That's a f uh, that's a fair point. I had um, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, I had lunch once with a bunch of books, independent booksellers in uh, San Francisco, and I asked them, you know, why not just put all the fiction together as fiction, regardless of what genre it might or might not be, just alphabetically from Asimov, to all, you know, to Zweig, and um, and but half of the booksellers thought, you know, that would be great, and the other half were completely horrified for the reason that you. Uh, alluded to, which is that readers come into the books are already knowing which section they're heading for, and and if they're if they can't do that, if they have to wade through all these boring other books to get to the crime fiction or whatever, they would be frustrated, and it wouldn't be a pleasant shopping experience. So, so I mean, I think it has evolved, but principally as a, a the idea of these quite rigid labels as a marketing. Tool, but it's but a ghetto too. I mean, that's the yes. thing, and and it can be. That, and the thing about ghettos is they can be very comforting places, in, in a sense, everyone around you is just like you, and and you know them, and there's a sense of protectedness at the same time that there's a sense of confinement and imprisonment, and you know that you want to tunnel out mm. um, of of the the wall that surrounds you. But at the same time, it, there is a sense, you know, if you're in a community like the science fiction community, for example, it's so close knit, and um, very supportive and encouraging of its up and coming younger writers and, and so on. Um, you know, it's a, there's a lot of ambivalence, I think, inherent in the idea. And I remember this American writer named Tayari Jones, uh, African American writer, and she wrote this piece about when her first novel got published and she went into a Barnes and Noble and they have an African American fiction section there. And, you know, she saw her book there and it was surrounded, you know, with Ralph Ellison and Zora Neale Hurston and all these great writers that whom she admired so much. And her first thought was this incredible rush of pride and sense of accomplishment. And then her immediate next thought was like, why aren't I over? Mm -hmm. Like her book wasn't over with just regular general the mainstream. mainstream fiction. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that she had that sharp sense of amb ambivalence. Emma, let's um, bring you in here because you're, you're, you won the Goldsmiths Prize last year, which, um, which I've seen described as a prize for novels which establish a genre or dissolve one. Now, were you conscious when you were... I mean, your, your book is an extraordinary uh, thing. You know, for those who haven't read it, I urge you to go out and buy it. It's, it's, the, it's an incredible kind of force of um, emotive, you know, brilliant kind of stream of consciousness writing. Were you conscious when you were... When you were writing this book, which I, I understand you wrote in quite a short, intense burst, of operating within a genre or doing something that was deliberately breaking conventions, uh, I think it was it was both for me because I was you know I was interested in in modernism, which you know depending on whether you will to include that as a genre or cultural movements in general. Um, uh, but I was at the same time interested in trying to do something else. With that, I felt that it had been, you know, um, unfairly left behind in the rush forward, and mm -hmm. that there was still plenty of room left to try something else. And uh, and so, you know, those sort of ideas uh, were there for me, especially you know Joyce and Beckett and mm -hmm. that. Um, but I was very conscious of the fact that I really wanted to try and work through all the ideas in a, in a slightly different way and, and maybe just kind of reverse the slightly overly aestheticised um, you know, things that we all associate with sort of high modernism and, and kind of take it backwards in a way. Uh, and also, I mean, it's, it, it's obviously kind of in that tradition of, of Irish literature. Did you have particular role models? A lot of your themes are, sort of seem very familiar but, but, but touched on in a very new and original yeah. way. Uh, well... I, I, was, I was very keen to try and not write about Ireland or sexual abuse or death or <laughs> <laughs> religion. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then I realised that if I, if I stuck to my guns there, there would be no book at all. <laughs> so uh, perhaps there had to be a bit of, sort of cleaning out uh, of the house first before I could uh, do something else. Um, 
but certainly, I mean, Joyce, obviously, mm -hmm. is, is inescapable. And that was, you know, that was the, the beginning of that journey for me, was reading Ulysses and just thinking, oh, God, <laughs> you know, I really have to start again. Mm -hmm. um, but then also very boldly thinking, I'll have a go at that. Mm -hmm. and yeah, well, I, you know, I kind of thought he's, you know, he's great, but my God, he, you know, he, he doesn't really give you anything. As a, you know, as a, a reader, you have to work all the time. And, you know, I really wanted to make the reader just work some of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a, a really interesting point, actually, which I, um, I'd like to pick up on, because there is this idea uh, to come back to the idea about the, the, the divide and the literary snobbery. Um, and again, Michael, you've written about this. The idea that, that of making the reader work, and if the reader has to work hard, and there's, not a, you know, there's, there's less sort of pleasure or joy in what they're reading, uh, it's better for you, and it's somehow more worthy. And I think we come back to what Christopher calls proper novels. Proper novels with um, you know, <coughs> <coughs> metaphors that you can't unpack, even though you ask everyone you know, and nobody knows what they mean. Um, <laughs> and again, you know, you've, you've talked about um, entertainment having a bad name, and, mm -hmm. and perhaps you could tell us, uh, talk a little bit about that, and, and where this divide comes from, this rather puritanical idea that... Well, yeah, I mean, I think the idea of pleasure is so paramount in the experience of, of, of reading, of being a reader. I mean, the reason I read, and I think the reason almost everyone in this room reads, is for pleasure, because it brings intense pleasure. But um, on the one hand, that whole notion of doing something for the sake of pleasure is frowned upon in certain quarters, um, historically and traditionally. Um, also, there's pleasure and then there's pleasure. And the definition of pleasure I, 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 and, and uh, the idea of entertainment is something that sort of p exists simply, purely to, to elicit some kind of um, pleasurable response in the consumer. Um, I, I think the reason that entertainment has, sounds like such a pejorative um, kind of designation is because the idea of pleasure has been somewhat debased too, and particularly the kind of pleasure that you get from reading. So for example, um, reading Amir's book was intensely pleasurable, but it was work. I mean, and part of the pleasure comes, and for me as a reader, comes from trying to meet the, the writer on his or, own, his or her own uh, territory, on their turf, and, and trying to engage with the writer on the level that the writer seems to want me to be engaging, and um, I get pleasure out of that too. And so, or you know, reading Joyce, reading Ulysses, or reading uh, Cormac McCarthy, Blood Meridian, for example. You know, it's a very challenging text in some ways, but it, the language is so um, exuberant and incantatory and, and and drunken in some ways that it's, you know, I get such a rush of physical pleasure from his prose. At the same time, I'm also working hard to try to stay on top of what's happening. And, and um, I think pleasure can be a much, especially in the literary context, can be a much more um, lofty mm. uh, ambition than is generally supposed. Well, some people get pleasure, don't they, from lying in the sun doing absolutely nothing. And some people get pleasure from walking up a mountain. Exactly. You know, some books are walking up a right. mountain books. I think there's, uh, when it, there's a distinction to be made also between complex books and complicated books. Mm -hmm. Complex books is, you're, you're, you're trying to say something very difficult in the simplest way possible, but it still comes out quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And then there's complicated books. I remember Geoffrey Hill saying once that accessibility is for public toilets. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you basically you're writing books to sort of um, draw a line in the sand between you and the people like you who can read it and mm -hmm. everyone else who's on the outside. Mm -hmm. But if you, if, if, but I love the challenge of language which is c complex but as, as, only as much as it needs to be. Can I also say that if anyone's, everyone should read your book as well, but what I found really interesting about it was you start the book reading complex, quite complex language, and you think this is going to be the difficult thing, mm -hmm. and that becomes very, very easy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster in there, which is in fact the, the traumatic and difficult thing. When I say traumatic, I mean you should read it, not traumatic, you should avoid it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, and um, the best challenging books definitely teach you how to read them as, as you go mm. along, and you, get, you tend to get the hang of it at a certain point. Um, 
uh, I mean, that's, I think, one of the marks of a worthwhile challenge in a, in a book. Well, is maybe we should also talk about the other thing about whether a book is literary or not, which is a Absolutely. It's slightly yeah. embarrassing thing to talk about, except that it's very real for me. And as soon as I pick up a book, I can read a page and I know, well, for, for me, the definition is someone who's above everything else they're writing about, they have a love of language. Mm -hmm. And the, the use of language is never mechanical or journalistic to get across a story or to get across an idea. But you think everything they write comes at root from a love of language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And the words are being tested and challenged and forced to sort of justify their position in the sentence. And um, they're all, I think the best sentences are ones that seem to sort of wake up the language that they're made out of and they wake you up as a reader too that you that they're, they're, you get a slight sense of um, surprise. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it as simple then to say that you know the way we distinguish literary novels from what is often dismissed as genre fiction is it's the quality of the writing, it's the quality of the, the, the author's style or does it also have something to do with what the content of the book. Well, I think well, you know, it ought to be that. To say. I think it ought to be the style, but it isn't. Usually, it's the cover art and <laughs> and where it is in the bookstore and how many copies it sells and and what prizes it has won. And I mean, a lot of sort of extra things that have nothing to do with the writing itself. Well, we certainly have. Um, I mean, in this country, we have a, a, a great tradition, for example, of of fantasy writing. Some of our most successful. Literary exports are, are magic or fantasy books. You think of Tolkien or J.K. Rowling, Philip Pullman, and yet those books are very rarely uh, appear on prize lists. And, and is, uh, we do, do seem to have established this sort of um, division between the literary establishment and I, I, I think what, what you said, Mark, there, this idea that it's, you know, you're, you're shutting yourself off with the people like me who can get this stuff. And, and is that very damaging for, for literature? As a whole, do you think? I have to, it's really tempting to answer those questions in a rather lofty way, and I have to put myself in the mind of a reader. Who, do, do readers bother about what is damaging to literature? Do they? Mm -hmm. Readers just want really good books, and I think we need to categorise them and advertise them in a way that doesn't that, that, that enables them to access all the, the books they want to read. That's certainly true, and, but at the same time, um, I mean, we're here. We're discussing books that are uh, shortlisted for a mm. prize that is uh, about judging literary quality. Yeah. So at a certain point, we, have to, we are making judgments about what is quality literature and, and what is not. And I think perhaps that's part of the problem with um, what, what gets dismissed as genre fiction. Uh, and yeah, as you were saying earlier, so M M Margaret Atwood or Cormac McCarthy write a book and it's clearly in the sci-fi mm -hmm. tradition, mm -hmm. but it's not labelled as sci-fi, mm -hmm. whereas somebody else who is perhaps less of a stylist is going to get put in that little ghetto of sci-fi if they've got spaceships or if it's set in the future. Well, right. I mean, I think there's this very common critical move where if a, a clearly a, 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 a writer of literary skill writes a work that is clearly a work of genre fiction, an exception gets made or dispensation mm -hmm. gets made, especially with, say, science fiction, a book like, like The Road, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, where, um, I mean, I actually think it's more of a horror novel than a science fiction novel, but still, a critic is faced with a book like that, clearly belongs to some cl clear uh, genre, and will say um, it's a fable, or it's a parable, or it's an allegory, or it's a this, or it's a that, or so anything, but actually <laughs> labeling it, you know, what it clearly is. Um, and, you know, when a writer, say like Kurt Vonnegut comes out of a science fiction background, clearly started publishing his first stories in the pulp science fiction magazines. He, he reaches a point not where they say, wow, Kurt Vonnegut's such an amazing writer. Science fiction is a really rich, mature genre of literature that we should be looking into to find other great writers like Kurt Vonnegut. Instead, they say, well, he's not really science fiction. Mm -hmm. if Kurt, it, 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 you get this special dispensation, whereas it's you know, science fiction unless you're Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, so the genre never seems to, to, to be elevated no, it's by its best its practitioners. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's kept in its place. Uh, Emma, just to come back to your book, you, you um, famously took a long time to find a publisher for this. <laughs> Were there, how long was it? Nine years. Nine years. <laughs> um, you were so patient. <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> were, there, were there points where 
you felt uh, maybe I should try and make this a bit more marketable or were, were you ever kind of did you ever doubt the story itself or think perhaps I'm, I'm not doing it this in a way that publishers know how to get a handle on or, or were you conscious of those kind of commercial pressures well when I was writing no I just thought yeah I'm just gonna write this and uh, it didn't occur to me that it would really be this terrible to get, <laughs> to get it published um, but it, it became clear quite early on that people found it too unmarketable or too unapproachable they felt it was too unapproachable for readers um, or for their marketing departments um, <laughs> And um, I, I didn't really, I didn't think I would ever change it. I never tried to. I certainly had a couple of things dangled in front of me where I was asked if I would say it was a memoir, then that right. might be encourage publication or yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and um, I didn't obviously feel I could do that in good conscience. Mm -hmm. um, it's so interesting. So all you have to do is tell people it's true, and yeah. they'll just put up with anything. Well, is that you know. <laughs> well, a, yeah. we, I think we, that certainly we certainly saw that with the James Fry memoir, didn't mm -hmm. we? Because mm -hmm. didn't he write that book originally, A Million Little Pieces? Is mm -hmm. it called yeah. the one that was on Oprah, and he got into terrible trouble because originally he'd written it as a novel, yeah. uh, and they couldn't sell it, and so he claimed it was then true. Mm. Yeah. Got on Oprah, sold millions of copies, mm -hmm. and then ha and then somebody said, "Hang on, you've made this up." Right. So again, I think there is a lot of what we talk about when we talk about genre in, in terms of modern contemporary publishing is uh, to do with these commercial pressures of, of, you know, how you market a book, how you get it to readers. Yeah, all absolutely. I mean, and certainly for, for Irish writers writing about sex and death, you know, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a template there that you can easily slide into if you say it's going to be a, oh, daddy, don't yeah. kind of novel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Uh, so it, the style really didn't seem to matter to them. That wasn't an obstacle. It was the content. Was right. all, you know, was all there for the genre, certainly. So that's interesting. So it's, it's, it's how you pitch it rather than this is a difficult read. Yeah. Because it, it obviously it isn't a difficult read in, in that sense. I think, I think the genre of mem memoir is the sort of monster that's taking over everything at the moment, mm. actually. Mm. Um, in some good ways, some, uh, some senses. Like the, the Carlo V. Uh, My Struggle novels, the six books. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that it's, he does something really interesting with autobiography. Um, has everyone been reading them? I assume that everyone, every Guardian reader in London is now reading them all. <laughs> um, so as you probably know, he does this, he, he's writing about his own life. It's, it's an utterly clear, pellucid autobiography, but then you, you stop and think, oh no, he's treating it completely like a novel, because he cannot have remembered all of this. It's treated exactly like a novel, even though it's his life. That works really well. But then when I look at, for example, American essays, I was reading the last, the best American essays of mm -hmm. last year, edited by Cheryl Strayed, and I got three quarters of the way through, and I thought, where did the essay go? Because this is, this is memoir. It's, it's all mini mm -hmm. memoir, the mm -hmm. whole thing. And I felt like a whole genre had died somewhere then. A memoir had come and just sat on it and squashed <laughs> it flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and again, maybe it's that idea that uh, an essay is quite difficult because it asks you to grasp different points and consider mm -hmm. an argument, whereas a memoir is just you're sort of sitting yeah. back Passively listening to someone tell you their story. But also, I also think if you call something mem if someone something genuinely is a memoir, it has an instant authenticity to it as well. There's a certain amount of work you don't have to do. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start mm. off by saying this is real, you've already scored points before you've mm -hmm. already sort of walked onto the pitch. Well, think, it's really. interesting because it takes you back in a way to sort of the primal sources of, of the novel, certainly in early modern fiction, where it was so, um, you know, usually the first novels presented themselves as fact and would, you know, it would in the town of B and you would sort of, you know, in the year in 18 whatever, that you would block out the date, you would block out the place or, you know, that you'd present them as epistolary novels presenting themselves as this sort of fake bundle of documents that you were just have, you're yeah. privy to. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's always been part of the DNA of the novel to pretend to be real to pretend to be an authentic kind of document maybe it's just I mean and you, you find that evolution in, in the history of a lot of genres and I mean even the there are there is a lot of work happening out there that is breaking down borders of from crime fiction to mm -hmm. science fiction or literary fiction crime fiction or whatever it might be and there are a lot of hybrids now and that's the sort of the stamp of our era and you know like those um those novels the temeraire I think where they're set in Napoleonic 
They're about uh, the sea battles between Britain and France, but there are also dragons in them. Uh -huh. and, um, <laughs> you know, that is a um, characteristic of a genre that's late in its evolution where you begin mm. to sort of cross pollinate, but that's also a characteristic of early in the history of a genre too. So in the very first, like Edgar Allan Poe's work, a lot of it is hard to say, is it quite, is it horror, is it science fiction, or is it gothic? And, you know, he, and he was blending, the categories hadn't quite hardened yet, and then they harden, and then at some point writers get trapped, feel trapped by those hardened categories and start trying to chip them down. And I think that's where we are in a lot of genres, and maybe something analogous is going to happen or is already happening with the memoir and the novel, that it, somehow there's blur, blurriness is occurring, although it's not right to take advantage of readers. The other credulity. interesting thing that he does in those uh, autobiographical novels is he manages to describe very boring things in a very thrilling way. And a lot of reviewers and readers say, I, I couldn't believe that just sort of trying to get hold of bottles of beer for a New Year's Eve party over 60 pages could be quite so <laughs> thrilling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that made me think about something. In fact, I'll ask you both about this. The, pa the, thing, the, the passages in novels I nearly always enjoy most involve very little event. One of the reasons I think that a lot of crime novels, for example, I don't tend to enjoy them is because crime novels tend to be so packed with event, the language often has to take second place to, quite obviously, to get, getting, getting stuff mm -hmm. happening. And um, when I'm reading your novels, I quite often like it when they slow down and you pause and take a look around, and the language sort of breathes a bit. And um, are, you, are you conscious of writing like that? And there are periods when you have to, stuff has to happen, mm -hmm. and you have to move more quickly, and then, mm -hmm. then you can pause and stuff doesn't mm -hmm. happen. Um, well, I know that as a reader, I, I don't like, I don't enjoy the experience of reading books that have too much plot in them. Yeah. Right? So, and not because there's anything wrong with plot, but just at a certain point I start to feel that I get this sense of anxiety in, in my stomach and, and I don't, I, I don't want to know what happens next on some level because it's too painful to be held in too much suspense. Um, and so I, you know, I, I like, I tend to just, m the books I love most tend to have strike a, somehow a perfect balance between incident and a forward momentum and ref that kind of reflectiveness or just a sense of, of having that amazing experience of feeling like you're inside the mind of another person and you know what it's like to be somebody else. Um, I mean, that's the main pleasure I get from reading is just to try to break out of my own head and be in someone else's mind, whether it's a fictional character's point of view and to be in, to be in the consciousness uh, of the protagonist of a girl as a half-formed thing, to just be living in this completely other world, thinking these thoughts and or whether it's to feel that sense of connection to the author, him or herself, um, you know, that's the main reason I'm reading. And you don't typically get that from, from the heist section <laughs> of the book, right? Um, but but one sometimes. Of the, one of the reasons why The Road, for example, was able to do that was because so little happens, really. Mm -hmm. It was maybe, was it horror, was it science fiction? Mm -hmm. But it had very little of the furniture of those genres, isn't it? A lot of right. it was just what it's like to be this person over a long period of time, mm -hmm. these two people. Right. Yeah, I know, and to the extent it did have the furniture, that was the more, those were the more disappointing aspects of the book yeah. to me, too. Um, yeah, but I think, on the other hand, if it's, all, if it's all sort of a static picture of consciousness, that can be, that can, I'll lose interest as a reader, too. I sort of had to have that perfect. How did you balance. see your novel from the inside? Um, well, I think in terms of, I mean, it was... Uh, a lot of, of, uh, of what happened was sort of dictated by how it was written in terms of not filling it with plot because actually I found trying to explain anything directly was the hardest part to write of the book and, and really just sort of letting people get on with deciding themselves what was going on was much easier. But to have any situation where someone has to directly explain something that's happening or has happened was really you know, horrific. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, yeah, I, I much prefer to um, 
to let people kind of just suffer along and <laughs> hope that they will understand <laughs> what's happening. And I think by and large they do. But that's it. I think one of the most extraordinary things about your book is that even though it's not it's not full of incident, it, it's the language that gives it this extraordinary mo momentum. And you are just propelled forward the, the whole time through the pace of the, this woman's thoughts and, and the way that she's unfolding, even though what is actually going on is, is really sort of quite small um, events. Yeah. But it's, it, there's this constant kind of page-turning momentum mm. because of the force of the language. That's what I loved about it. I know, and you care about her so much. You want, you know, you're, her, and her life is moving forward. You want to just find out, what, oh, God, what's going to happen now? Let's talk a, a little bit about um, what you were saying about imagination and, and getting into to somebody else's head because, um, Mark, I know you said in a previous interview, and I know there's also nothing worse than being reminded of what you said in an interview five years ago, but um, you made the distinction between you know, what we might call genre fiction by saying genre allows you to pretend to be... You, know, you can imagine you're a spy or you're a space traveller mm. or you're a, a detective or whatever it might be. It takes you out of your own world. Mm -hmm to somewhere else, whereas what we might call literary fiction um, allows you to see into the world of people who, whose lives might be quite like your own and actually look at the, what is going on within what might look on the surface like quite a narrow sort of field of vision, but actually there's just as much scope for imagination within that. I think I agree with myself. Does that remind <laughs> you? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I was being very, very black and white about it, but there... There is something in that I'm, I'm really looking for um, in a book. I think writing, writing for me is ultimately always about death in the end. It's always about <laughs> finitude. It's about how you cope with being stuck in one body at one time and you won't be here forever. And you're trying somehow to tap into something a bit bigger. You're talking to people who are dead. You're talking to people who are not yet born. But you're also talking about the sort of the the daily bittiness of your life. And some of the novels I love best just return you to the small things in your life and you think, there, is a there are many other worlds I could escape to, but right here, right here in my lap is a sort of, is a, there are just galaxies here that you could sort of lose yourself in. And ultimately that excites me more than pretending to be an actual spaceman in a mm -hmm. book or pretending to be fighting aliens, as thrilling as that can be. It's learning how to sit in a chair and be, be, be happy in your finitude. A really good book does give me that. Michael, you've really done both. You know, you've mm. written highly acclaimed books of what we might call science fiction or fantasy, and, um, and then you've also written books that are, are very recognisably in our contemporary mm -hmm. um, setting in, in a, particularly thinking of Telegraph Avenue, in a, in a world that you clearly know very well that is a recognisable real world. Mm -hmm. When you are coming up with an idea for a story, uh, do you, is it the setting that comes to you first or do you think this is a, an emotion, a scene I want to explore and therefore it belongs within this kind of setting? How does that um, work? Well, you know, I think I don't really distinguish sharply between the experience. I mean, it, it all for me, it's all about reading and being a reader. It all starts with reading for me, and the reason I write is because I love to read. And as a reader, from the earliest, from the time I first began to read, I never, I just read everything, and I, you know, I, it's not like I was indiscriminate in the sense of not being aware that there are different kinds of books sort of offering different kinds of potential experiences to the reader, but, but I mean, I would have to say I maybe slightly disagree or, or sort of twist um, Mark's words a little bit, but, um, you know, to me, ultimately, a book is a great book, whether it's about a spaceman fighting aliens or it's about someone, you know, in a bed sit um, um, in Bethnal Green. Um, if I have the identical sense of being taken out of, I mean, I don't, I get just as much trans sense of transport from a great book set in a very recognizable, familiar kind of setting as from a great book set in a completely, uh, you know, alien, not necessarily in the science fictional sense of the word setting. Um, and that's what I'm looking for as a reader, so that's what I try to provide as a writer, and I don't, I don't really 
stop to worry about, you know, is, is this in the right genre or is this going to be considered literary or not? I mean, maybe I used to worry a little bit more about that. And in fact, I certainly did worry about that when I first started out. Um, then I went to a writing program, creative writing program at the University of California, Irvine, and um, was writing sort of borderline science fiction stuff. I was really into J.G. Ballard at that time. I, I still love Ballard and Italo Calvino, and, and those writers were sort of my models for people who seemed to be pushing against boundaries. And I showed up in the workshop, and you know, I turned in a couple of stories, and people just said, oh, I hate science fiction. Uh, you know, I don't read science fiction. I can't help you. I have nothing to say. I, they wouldn't even mm -hmm. try to see if maybe something else might be going on in these pages. You know, I'll, they would just look and see a word that seemed like a weird Star Trek planet name, uh. and just you know, <laughs> that'd be it. Like there's just I, they just turn off the machine. So, and I thought, well, here I am, and this is costing me money to be here, and I have these great teachers and educated, well-informed peers. I should just take advantage of it. So I, I just stopped doing that and started to write more mainstream kind of stuff just to, so I could get the benefit of the experience of being there. Um, but I mean, winning a Pulitzer Prize is very, you know, reassuring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I worry about that less now. I feel yeah. like I have you know, more liberty. Um, but I mean, what the starting place for me increasingly and has been for a while now, is it tends to be uh, just an area of interest, um, some, a subject that I'm interested in or a time that I'm interested in or, you know, with Yiddish Policeman's Union, I love Raymond Chandler's work and, and I love, um, and I was interested in Yiddish and I had always wanted to learn more about it and, uh, you know, there were, there were things, and chess plays a big part in that book and I've always been interested in chess and wish I knew more about that. So they, I tend to write about things that I, I wish I knew more about, I suppose, is usually a thing. And uh, so even with Telegraph Avenue, even though it's set in the part of, in my neighborhood, essentially, where I live, um, even, even to that extent, though I live there, I did have a sense that there was more going on around me in the past, in the pl history of the place I, had li I was living, and also just in the lives of the people around me, there was more that I wanted to know. And I, so it's always, a, and there's always an element of res research. Well, where, where do you begin, Mark? Because I know that you've, you've written poetry and, and children's stories and uh, recently adult novels and a play. Where do you, when you begin with an idea, do you think, oh yes, this needs to be told in a particular oh, way, or I do just you just stumble around in the dark? <laughs> it's, it sounds like it's quite a good plan, being able to write many different sorts of things. I, I think it's quite a problem sometimes. Because if I, if I just wrote novels, I, I'd know that I had to take the ideas I had and sift through them, which is a good idea for a novel, and just force it into that format. I mean, recently I've been trying to write plays. I mean, I hugely enjoyed writing a play a few years ago at the Donmar Warehouse. The experience was fantastic. Um, in many, many respects, you get out of the house, you meet other people. I love being with actors, they're <laughs> fantastic. And most extraordinary is watching, sitting in a room where readers or an audience react to something that you have written in real time, which of course you never get as a novelist. Mm. That's an amazing experience. So I've been trying to write plays again, and I think it's rather belatedly dawned on me that I'm writing plays because I want that experience, rather than because <laughs> I want to write plays. Mm -hmm. And a couple of days ago I had this sort of moment where I just realised that it just wasn't working at all. I had to finally sort of give it up. And as soon as I said that to myself, I realised that some of these plays were in fact rather good stories. Mm -hmm and they would work. I also realised that, the, the, that um, the dynamics of play are very different from those of a novel. I didn't really realise this until I was on a plane back from Copenhagen where I'd gone with Simon Stevens who adapted Curious Incident for the Stage to see the Danish opening of Curious. Very, very odd experience. To see a play that you know very well in a language you don't. Um, it's a bit like having a stroke. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> un understanding Everything apart from the words. Mm -hmm. well, all, uh, apart from fuck shit and Didcot Parkway. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, have a profound, I have a profound fear of flying, so Simon gave me his half-hour seminar on playwriting on the, on the plane on the way back. He, we talked. We talked even during takeoff. I, I, it was astonishing to think that happened. And he told me something which I'd never really thought about before. He said, you can write a whole novel about something happening to someone. 
You can't write a play about something, something ha happening to someone. You have to go into every scene with everyone wanting to do something, want to get something mm -hmm. done, or the whole thing just goes flat. And he said, he said, give me some of your ideas. And I trotted off these ideas. He said, no, that's not going to work. No, that's not going right. to work either. And he said, you're... They're, they're novelist ideas. You see a situation, you like it. You see a, a place, you like it. You see a group of people and you love them. Mm -hmm. He said, when I write a play, it has to be someone trying to get something done and really wanting to get something done. And in Simon's case, hopefully someone being bludgeoned to death with a rock <laughs> at the end as well. Because <laughs> he writes that kind of play. <laughs> This is um, great, actually, because we're, we're rather belatedly touching on the kind of form side of this, uh, this subject. Um, and I, I'd like to expand on that because I know, Michael, you've written screenplays and uh, TV. And, uh, Ima, I know you also trained in drama. That was your, your background originally. Um, what do you think that, that brings to your writing as novelists, given that you've all worked in that area of drama? Um, how do you feel that changes the way you write novels, or, or does it? Does it have much bearing on when you come to write fiction? Um, well, for me, it was a huge influence, actually. Um, I had a very uh, serious method training. Um, <laughs> and um, it was, you know, it was pretty laboured when it came to, to acting, but actually it was great when it came to, uh, to writing a novel. Mm. And, you know, I think a lot of, of you know, what I learned about inhabiting a character fed into how I wrote So the how girl. much method research There's did you have to do <laughs> for this book? Well, you know, I, I feel I, I couldn't frightening. possibly say, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, yes, it, it was... Uh, I gave it the Daniel Day-Lewis treatment, certainly. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, Michael, do you feel that... Are you very conscious of the kind of demands of drama when you're writing a novel? Does that...? Not as much as I ought to be, I think. Um, <laughs> I will, I mean, I do know, you know, one of the fundamental things you get taught when you're learning how to write is to write in scene. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think Henry James was sort of the first person to really hammer home the importance of scene to writing of novels. And sometimes in his books, you find big chunks of what's almost just pure dialogue with very little um, description. Um, and I think talk about the air going out of something. I think mm -hmm. that frequently happens. For me, when I'm writing, um, I'll be writing and writing and writing, maybe get up to 15, 20 pages into a chapter and just have this sense of fatigue and lack of interest and, and that it's something's not working right and I don't know what it is and I'm feeling bored with what I'm doing. And then I'll look back and, and realize it's just all summary. That I, haven't, I haven't stopped and actually just let my characters want something and try mm. to get something. I mean, you, you do have to do that within a novel, too, that you, it's not enough to just be talking about what happens. The characters are interacting, and, and very often I do... Sometimes I have presence of mind to remember to start that way and just have someone, you know, or I know because my story demands that someone has to come in and ask someone to let them do something, whatever it might be. Um, but a lot of times I, I have to go back and realize that this whole thing is just complete. Um, boring summary and I have to reconceive the entire section or chapter as an actual dramatic scene as if mm -hmm. it were a play between with the characters trying to stop each other or, or help each other or whatever it might be from doing something getting something done so what will you are you going to try another play or are you gonna for the moment no, this week this week I've given up forever next <laughs> <week>. <laughs> Um, I, I was talking with a friend on the way here about an idea I had, uh, I've had for a long time. I've been slightly obsessed with the Mars missions. And um, by chance, the other night, I met one of the, the 1,000 people who signed up for, uh -huh. you know, the sort mm -hmm. of Dutch private company who's yeah. going to the one-way ticket to Mars. Mm -hmm. In fact, we met them at a science fair with my son, who was nine, who's quite upset about it afterwards. I was quite upset about it. This young man who said he's taking a one-way ticket to Mars. Even if they get there, he'll never come home again. My son asked him, how do your family feel about this? He said, oh, they're, they're OK about it. And he got a bit tearful later thinking about it. And I've been thinking, what a great idea for a play, because plays are mostly about confined spaces, people mm -hmm. locked in a room. That's 50% kind of, mm -hmm. of the plays ever written. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, what it is, you have, plays can't spill out, can't they? have to be kind of squeezed yeah. in to make, to make the pressure. It's got to be a burning building to some extent. 
And I thought, it must work, it must work. It's perfect for a play. And then I was watching a documentary about the NASA trip to Mars, and I suddenly realised I'm just in love with all the details. The details are just fantastic mm -hmm. about how you use... You put the food around the outside of the spacecraft to stop the radiation coming in. Mm -hmm. What do you do with two years of human faeces? Um, yeah. you have There's to your title right there. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite thesis fact about it, they were saying, why can you not chuck it out into space? But of course, you're in the middle of space, there's no gravity, everything's moving at the same speed. It's you just chuck funny. your thesis out, and then for two years, it's floating ten yards outside your window. <laughs> <laughs> Travelling in the same direction. When you finally get to Mars, it all comes down around you in a, in a great shadow. But I, I think I realised that what you can do in a novel, of course, you, that, in that detail, is you can... It's love, it, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. In film, it's someone else's job. On, in the stage, you have to stop doing it because that's the director's job. But in, in the novel, you can, you can really enjoy it. So I think that's why I realised that heart on the novelist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Ema? Do you, are, you going to, are you working on another book now? Do you have any aspirations to write in different forms? Or? Uh, I'm working on, uh, on uh, my second book now. And um, yeah, I, I, don't, I think I would be interested in, in writing for the theatre, but probably not in a very sort of straight five men and some conversation kind of way. Mm. I'm maybe try and find something else to do. But yeah, I, I'm certainly very interested in, in the theatre. And is your new book, uh, I mean, will it be in a similar style or are you, are you playing around with that <laughs> again? Or? Um, it's, it's similar. It's, it's, it's a slightly more sort of evolved version, I think. But I'm not finished, so I still don't really know. Uh -huh. uh, I expect I'll find out as I go along. Exactly. Well, um, I'd love to give you the chance to um, ask our panel some questions now. We have got a, a microphone that's going to run around um, with you, so uh, please don't be shy. And, uh, and if you, again, you know, if you have particular specific questions for one or other of the authors or about particular things that they've written, um, as long as it's not about Mark's research. <laughs> um, he might run away uh, but uh, yeah please do um, put hands up we've got a lady over here oh go there first of all and then we'll, we'll come to you here thanks um, Michael you said at first about the idea well you said in a different context about being reassured and, and, and I guess in some ways I, mean, I wonder if this is a kind of conversation that's about reassuring you know about genre and, and form um, because there's a kind of tension there that, that's been discussed. And I'm, I'm going to you know, ask the panel if this is about reassuring. I don't remember, maybe it was Louis Armstrong when asked, you know, what kind of music he liked or, you know, and didn't like, said it was only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. But I think probably, you know, for most of us, certainly for myself, you know, there's different times I want to listen to different type of music. I want to listen to blues, want to listen to rock, want to listen to classical, um, whatever. Sometimes want to have all of us to extend a different, to mix another metaphor, you know, fine cuisine and sometimes a burger. Um, and then, you know, Marx also said, uh, you know, well, some people have pleasure lying in the sun and others climbing a mountain. But I think, again, most of us, I do, like to do both and sometimes even possibly in the same day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess the, the question is, that, you know, the, these genres and different, well, let's say with genre particularly, are convenient. Um, but maybe not to be taken too seriously, and, and, and yet to be used for that convenience to find the different ways into pleasure. And, you know, is, is that maybe just a, enough to say about this whole discussion, in a way, without reducing it, but, you know, it's important to have the discussion, but isn't just maybe to reassure, reassure ourselves as readers and you as writers that, it, you know, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we ask what you read? Maybe will that answer the question? I... I have no idea if that will answer the question or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I, don't, I don't know, I think it's a... It's do you right read widely just... between...? Uh, I suppose I do. I, I, um, yeah, I, have, I don't read a lot of contemporary fiction and I find that more soothing uh, as a writer in a way um, because it doesn't clutter me <coughs> and I, I mean, for me, the idea of genre is not important at all, actually. And I think, you know, my book can fit into a whole range of, of different genres. And, you know, you can, it's a gothic horror novel as well as, you know, anything else. Um, and so as a writer, it's not important to me in any way, actually. 
Um, and as a reader, I try not to be too um, uptight about it as well. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think the really important distinction that Mark made when he was starting out was between what happens with a, when a writer is sitting down to work and what happens when a reader picks up a book um, and we could re try to reassure ourselves or feel reassured about both those things, but then there's the, also the incredibly important part about what happens when it gets a cover slapped on it and sent out into the bookstore, and um, you know we have no control over that or very little control, and um, readers don't have any control over that either. And it's such a, I think that can be a damaging, um, limiting. Factor in both the writer's experience in preparing and planning and, and ho hoping and, and frankly to, to just being financially able to do what they want to do and um, readers being able to encounter books that they might not otherwise encounter um, because it is I mean they, they had that genius idea with your ISBN numbers that was brilliant but but it took it took yeah. a kind of subterfuge like that to sort of circumvent this mechanical process of sorting. And some of the boundaries are even more physical. Um, I'm talking to my editor, who, Dan Franklin, who's published a lot of um, graphic novels, mm -hmm. and comic fiction. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'd never really thought about this before, he said one of the big uh, barriers to getting them to the people who would really enjoy reading them is the physical size of the book. Mm -hmm. you, um, sadly, with fewer and fewer bookshops, it'll, be, it'll become less and less important. But most fiction shelves are like that. They're built for paperbacks, aren't they? You have to go to another mm -hmm. section of the shop completely to see graphic fiction. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a great graphic novel like Exit Wounds by Ruth and Modan, it's just it's too big to fit on the shelf. Mm -hmm. it's too and tall. He's, yeah, and he says, how can we get round this? It's um, apart from asking bookshops to have bigger shelves. Mm -hmm. So often, <laughs> how do you how do you physically get the books that you know certain people like? How do you get them sitting in front of them when they stand on the shelf? It's true. Even as a reader, it's an. I, I, you know, I, I have a pretty extensive collection of graphic novels and it's really annoying. You have to, you have to bracket part. up, you know, you have to take up some, and then they have these beautiful, splendid ones sometimes that are the little Nemo and Slumberland things, you know, this tall. What am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> I love it, but, <laughs> it's, you know, you're right, that's it, that is interesting. But that's partly where prizes can play a big part because, you know, I think almost for the first time we had a graphic novel on the Costa Awards yeah. shortlist last mm -hmm. year and you know I don't regularly go to the graphic novel section but again that was you know there and they published that in a format that looked that like That was a really long one so that stuck out of the shelf which is an entirely yeah. different <laughs> <laughs> It's another problem. It's all maybe ebooks will um, render all these problems obsolete eventually. Uh, there was a lady over here. Thanks. Yes. Hello. Um, it seems to me there's a proliferation particularly in the United Kingdom of prizes at the moment. It's, it seems what's happening within writing and publishing. Do you think we're sort of creating a meta genre, especially financially in terms of sales, in as the genre of the prize-winning book novel story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there too many prizes? <laughs> um, Hardly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say when I when I that when I found out I had won the Pulitzer Prize, um, and I went that afternoon to pick my son, my older son, up at nursery school, and he was three at the time, and um, you know, I went and got him, and I said, Daddy won a prize today. And he said, open it, open it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can't have too much of that kind of, <laughs> I mean, ultimately, let's think about what it means to a writer, so, someone who's particularly, if, if someone who's just starting out or has gone unrecognized or is working in a cumbersome, physically cumbersome, you know, genre where it doesn't even fit on the shelf properly, um, it, can, it can shine a, set, a deserved light on someone who might so, otherwise yeah. go completely unrecognized. Well, that can't what, be a bad thing. What does it mean to you to have been, well, I mean, to have won various... It's obviously, it's, a, it's very important for me and, you know, having spent so long trying to get the book published and then it being published by, you know, a, a very adventurous indie publisher, but who doesn't necessarily have the reach of, of the big presses. You know, it's it's been a really important um, part of the of getting the book out there for me, and it's you know it's created an attention, given the book an attention it never would have received otherwise. So I, I can't complain. <laughs> and if you look at the, I mean, if you look at the art, the shortlist for the Folio Prize, 
and the shortlist for you know the prize that shall not be named, um, <laughs> the Voldemort Prize. Um, <laughs> they're totally different. There are no two. Yeah. There's no overlap whatsoever. I, I believe, and so it hardly. If that's a genre then it's like the genre of books that are sold in bookstores or something like that. It's not very descriptive, yeah. really. Also, I think society as a whole is obsessed mostly with competition and with gossip. And if you want to get people to talk about books, yeah. that's the two way you do it. You have competitions or you have to gossip about your personal life. Mm -hmm. And I'd always prefer to be involved in giving a <laughs> prizes rather than authors having to talk about their survival from cancer over the last few years or some other all aspects of their personal life, you don't really want to share, but you're, you're pressed to share it because that'll draw in readers. Well, actually, the, some of the best um, uh, press for literary prizes has involved both. You know, when there's a bit of mm. gossip, when there's a bit of uh, uh, disagreement between the, um, between the judges, that always gets the prizes into the press. So, um, yeah, I hope maybe tomorrow there'll be some sort of massive fist fight. We're, we're, and, we're, uh, we have something <laughs> you know, planned, yeah. but I can't <laughs> really, really talk about it. Um, do we have another... Question. Oh, yeah. Look, great. There's a, a lady up there and a uh, guy down here. We'll take. We'll, co we'll take this this one down here first. Thanks. Um, thank you. I've really in enjoyed this discussion. I'm curious. I mean, uh, Amy, you were saying you almost kind of found yourself working in a genre by accident, or as it sounded like, um, Michael and Mark, you uh, kind of almost because you enjoyed reading. I mean, especially Michael, you enjoyed reading in the genre. I was curious. Also for you, Stephanie, because you're in quite self-effacing, talking about everybody else's books. Mm. Um, so it's really a question for all of you about, can working in a genre, once you're aware you're working in a genre, can that be that constraint be liberating? Or do, is it something that you kind of consciously work with or against? Um, is it a friend or a foe or both? Thank you. Why don't you start? Oh, start. OK. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I wrote um, a couple of what... Um, uh, what I like to think of, what, what Christopher uh, in Curious Incident would call proper novels, when I started, because I had this sort of snobbery bred into me, I think, by, by doing an English degree, that, uh, that crime fiction, which I loved as a teenager, was a little bit kind of um, beneath my notice uh, if I was going to study literature properly. And I, and I came back to it. Um, and part of what I found exciting about it was... Um, the challenge, of, because as, as Michael was saying, there are these conventions, there are certain expectations of a particular genre. So if you're, if you're writing a murder mystery, there is an expectation that there will be certain red herrings and suspects and clues, and at the end there will be a, a satisfying resolution um, of one kind or another. And, and what interests me about a lot of contemporary crime drama and fiction is the way that authors are playing with that, and certainly the idea of justice being served isn't always necessarily what it used to be in the, in the conventional detective story um, and that has been uh, I found that really fun I found it really it, yeah liberating in a way to be able to take those conventions and think well this is the scaffolding this is the framework within which I've chosen to work what can I do within it that's interesting and different um, so yeah that to me that's what what the genre offers in that sense yeah um, I think for me it was really just the the, the thing that pointed the direction just pointed the way and then I went off and felt I did my own thing afterwards but certainly since publication I found that framework has helped me to discuss the book possibly and that's how it's been most helpful to me yeah uh, I, mean, I think if you're if you're really approaching if you're consciously approaching a particular genre whether as a writer or, you know a filmmaker and you want to do it in a serious, literary, whatever term you want to use, way, you, you have a responsibility to be well informed about that genre or subgenre, as the case may be, and to, to be aware of its history and of all of its conventions so that, you know, for like an example would be, a positive example would be, say, a movie like um, Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs, where it's a heist movie that's seen every heist movie ever made and knows all the conventions and knows you have to have the scene where they, you know, they get their code names and you have to have the scene where they reconvene after they try to d divide up the money or whatever it is. And, and he takes all of those conventions and, and they're all there and yet they're all 
first of all, it's told in completely non-chronological order, but then they all get skewered or exploded or inverted or, or somehow played with or reworked in a way. And I mean, that's maybe the most, most extreme example of the procedure I'm talking about, but I think you have a responsibility to, to, to perform that procedure and to do your due diligence as mm -hmm. a producer of a work within this genre. Um, you know, so that, for example, once I realized which is fairly early on that in my book, The Yiddish Policeman's Union, I was working with alternate history. It was a form I already knew something about and I had read you know, several works of alternate history over the years and loved them from Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle to um, uh, this great book called The Year of Salt. Or Year of, what's it called? It's Kim Stanley Robinson, Rice and Salt. Yeah, where the Black Death um, wiped out all of European civilization in the Middle Ages and what happens to the world as a result of that. Um, but then I went and read more and just, I really want to know what is typically done and what are the conventions of the this sub genre of alternate history. Um, so that when I went to do it myself, both, and this ties in again to what Mark was saying about language, you know, you, you just as with language, you have a responsibility to avoid cliche and to not employ stale language um, I think you have a similar responsibility toward the conventions of the genre you're working to avoid cliche. Or if, you, if you're employing cliche to do it the way Tarantino does, say, and break it or twist it or, or defy it in some way. Um, you know, and that, again, that's a problem I had with The Road, although I admire that book a lot. Um, but the parts of it that are science fiction-y, <coughs> they seem to betray a complete lack. You don't have the sense that Cormac McCarthy went and read all the mm -hmm. great works of post-apocalyptic fiction that have been written starting with Tom's A Cold um, by John Collier, which predates even the idea of nuclear holocaust um, to portray a world where civilization has broken down here in England. Um, you know, it just, it feels as though he didn't know that there was Mad Max movies with motorcycle gangs and, <laughs> you know, or just the little bits, you don't get very many, you're right. Mm. It, it, but the little bits you get of the world that he's portraying feel so um, well trodden, and yet they're not per they're not portrayed in a way that's has that sort of self awareness or that self consciousness. And I think that's the flaw, and that's why I prefer not to look at that book as science fiction because I think it falls down on that level. I rather look on from the outside and 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 wish that I could. I wish I could be in love enough with one genre to to adopt it and try and write a book in that genre because I'd like for once to start a book with at least some rough kind of outline or expectation. Mm -hmm. So I could, there be... It doesn't help. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're still groping okay, in the dark, okay, yeah. <laughs> but you did, to an extent, you did with, with Curious Incident mm -hmm. because you, I mean, that was That's very... That's a very well-informed book. It was I mean, very book deliberate. Knows, it? Yeah. Yeah, it but is, it's, you know, he, he's... So that's a genuine up. question, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's that book is aware of its predecessor, it feels aware exactly. of its... Which ones? I'm, quite, I'm genuinely interested to tell me which like predecessor. Like boy detective genre, sort of... Oh, yeah, which your narrator is very consciously setting out to write. You know, he says at the beginning, yes. this is what I'm well, going to Well, there are genres like science fiction where if you, if you want to be aware of science fiction, you have to go and read a lot, don't you? Because a lot of those conventions are kind of buried. But there are certain genres which are so much in the air you just have to be a reasonably awake, literate person to have soaked up some of those ideas mm, I don't think it's that easy. I think you must have been paying more attention than you, than you <laughs> realize. <laughs> you know, I think you have to be paying attention to notice that kind of stuff. Maybe you just don't even know you it's were doing It's so natural. So. It just, <laughs> it just I know, I'm, genu I'm trying to remember what, what, what books were in the background. We had this series in the US, I don't know if you had them here, the Encyclopedia Brown books, which, which are about this boy detective and small town. And, and I, I remember I had been thinking, like, what a great thing it would be to have this boy detective. Um, you know, he's the smartest kid in Idaville or wherever he lives. Um, and his dad's a chief of police. I'm talking about Encyclopedia Brown books. But now what if you set this in a much more realistic kind of setting and there'd be something kind of weird about that kid and I had started to sort of <laughs> take a few steps down the pathway of trying to imagine doing a kind of you know damaged boy detective sort of story and then this book The Curious <laughs> Incident of the Doctor <laughs> when night came out I, like, I tell you what, I didn't read any of those books what I did read I read science books and when I was a kid I read almost no fiction at all hmm. 
So the book is, you know, it's divided mm. into mm. sort of uh, mm. narrative and non-narrative. And in fact, I read very little narrative at all, but I read a lot about the non-narrative stuff. That was what my childhood was filled with, books about chemistry and the universe, cosmology and Big Bang and atoms. Mm -hmm. Great. We, I know we have one more question. There was a, somebody's got the microphone. Where has it gone? It was over here. Am I right? Oh, there was somebody down here. Oh, sorry, the lady up in the middle, in the green. Um, and then we'll, we'll take more. We'll just do, yeah, very quickly, we'll take one. Uh, there. I've always forgotten, but what I wanted to pick up on was the difference. You mentioned, Michael, I think, about an African-American writer in the appropriate section. And it seems to me, in the US particularly, there's a confusion between the genre of the book and of the writer. Mm -hmm. mm. And... Uh, much more so than sort of, uh, I th it's probably come here. So we have gay writers and this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking a while ago about James Baldwin, I liked very early on, how he would have hated being called a black writer mm -hmm. because he wanted to be seen as an American writer. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little bit worried about the confusion of whether it's true or false and whether it's the, the writer who is gay or the book who ha that has a gay theme and mm -hmm. so on and so on. But I think mm. you've got the point I'm trying yes. to make. Yes, I mean, I think... It's, as I was saying, I mean, to, it can be, there is a sense of empowerment and of support and of community that you can get. If the alternative is to not have a section in the bookstore at all and for your books not to be sold in the bookstore at all, it's much preferable for there to be a section in the bookstore that's so designated, I think. But the pattern... In, with immigrant groups to America has typically been that you, if you pass through a period of uh, persecution and uh, prejudice and discrimination, then you arrive eventually at assimilation and acceptance. And it happened with you know, the Irish immigrants first and then Italians and Jews. And um, it's happening now uh, to a great extent with Asians and South Asians and, and uh, the United States. And the one group that sort of has never happened for in some respects, has been African Americans. And um, so that even the gay, like when I was starting out in my first book, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, was readily and rapidly shelved in the gay literature section of bookstores all across the country, um, even though, um, you know, I didn't necessarily think that's where it ought to be, since I'm not a gay writer, um, as far as I knew. Um, <laughs> didn't seem to me but now I don't even think most bookstores have a gay section anymore and and the whole idea of sort of the gay novel that was sort of a viable category in 1988 when when my first book came out has sort of disappeared and we and we do just basically have writers who may or may not be gay and their books are not are put you know whether it's um, you know like a Michael Cunningham for example and still the African-American fiction category sort of persists, I think. Um, it's, it's, it's always going to be the last category to get broken down, I fear. And, but on the other hand, like I said, I mean, there is a sense of pride in, in accomplishment that this Tayari Jones reported feeling. That was her first response. I think it's important to, to notice that, even though her immediate follow-up was to feel excluded in some way or to, to feel left out. You know, people want to label, that labeling is what we do. Um, we label everything and pigeonhole everything. And I think it's definitely always been one of the writer's first tasks to try to subvert that labeling and undermine it and um, at least confuse it, confuse the process as much as possible. So There was a lovely moment in the early 80s. I remember being in Camden. I can't remember the name of the big bookshop used to be on Camden High Street. Um, but anyway, for several weeks, they decided to split the whole shop into gay literature and straight literature. Mm -hmm. And um, that, was the only, that was the only categorization. It was alphabetical in both sides. And if you were, if you were a gay or possibly gay or you'd never actually come out or there was gay subject, it was over there uh -huh. and a straight was over. It was just, actually, it was rather good fun. Mm -hmm. because, <laughs> and I wonder if whether bookshops ought to do more of this. You went in and just, it just made you look at everything in right. a completely different way. Right. I mean, that's what was behind my idea of suggesting to these booksellers that just put all the fiction together and yeah. see what happens. What's mm -hmm. it like? Just to see romance writers, you know, yeah. cheek by jowl with science fiction and, and um, you know, Tolstoy. And what does that look like? How does it feel? Is it shocking to see that? Every so often a bookstore will sort their books by color. 
and, and publish the pictures on the web. Have you ever seen that where they, they have all the red books and then the yellow books? And, and anything you can do like that to just make you realize, oh, I've, I've gotten into this habit of not even seeing at all because I'm so used to seeing things the same way that I don't see them at all anymore and what you're talking about. And just shaking this Even by colored, just anything that makes you reconsider the categories. Well, we're hoping very much that, um, that this prize and, and its shortlist will do exactly that, will shake up and, and uh, allow us to look at a selection of books on their own individual qualities rather than you know, our preconceived ideas about them. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up here now because um, we've run over time. Uh, we will be uh, signing books over in the library, um, as Andrew said. And uh, again, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. And I'm, I'm sure that if you didn't get a chance to ask uh, the authors questions, they will be happy to chat to you while they're signing books. Um, so please join me in thanking Michael Shabon, Mark Haddon, <laughs> Emma McBride. <laughs>